All right. Hey, good morning. I want to offer a good morning as well. I am uh, bringing a message for the whole church family. So uh, we're welcoming folks in the sanctuary. Uh, I'm going to let uh, Rolando preach this message in Espanol. I asked him if I could. He said, probably not. So um, because I can't, but I want to say, yes, uh, praise God for all that he's done. Christmas was amazing around here. Uh, we're going to talk about vision forward and we're going to land with uh, an application for all of us that is like a daily application that you're going to hear about. So I'm real excited about the days to come. We had an incredible uh, Christmas uh, season. Many of you were here. We had 3,500 plus people on Christmas Eve. It was amazing. The most we've had in a long, long time. I'm curious, no shame, but how many of you still have Christmas decorations or lights up? Anybody? Anybody? Okay. And in, in the sanctuary, just raise your hand. Come on. Mass confession. Now, these are my people. Watch this. How many of you still have your Christmas tree up and you're lighting it up? Like, let's just, how many, how many of you have lights on your house and you're like, whatever, I'm leaving them up for the, just the whole year. Okay. No, we're not going to do that. Love Christmas, but let's keep celebrating um, the incarnation of Jesus. He has come to set us free. And today we're going to talk about what it is to really really know him. You know, he's come and then how to know him. Now, before we do, I want to say just a few things here. This is a great opportunity. We got a big crowd here today and, and uh, it's a great day to commit, to serve. It's a great day to um, decide. I'm finally going to get in a connect group, really connect with other people. I met some new folks today. Lots of you are new today. We're glad that you're here. God is doing an incredible work in our church. Like I, I mean, you would expect the pastor to say that I love our church. I love our people, and I love what God is doing here. Today at 5 o'clock, by the way, there's a, a meeting in the loft, which is right above uh, the Great Hall, and it's an info meeting for South Texas. It's time to serve, right? Dive in to serve opportunities here in the church, in the city, and really around the world. So you've got an opportunity there. Uh, even as our uh, young adults head off to Guatemala this week, um, getaway weekend is coming for our students in February. That's the first week of February. All of this moving us towards Easter. And listen, we're changing. Now, this is not going to impact us in big ways, but just to know our service times, 930 currently, and it will remain that 930, the early hour, if you will, of worship. And then 1045. This is in response to a um, survey that we've done. We'll be unpacking some of that along the way, but we're responding to the family, church family to say, Probably too large of a gap between connect groups and, and worship, and we need more time in our services. So a little bit more time in our services, and it's going to serve us well. What we're going to do now is dive into the series that's going to lead us into the new year. Um, and it's, we're even titled it, I Am. You can see that in your bulletin and such. I uh, see it online. But the ultimate goal, we said last week, if you're with us, we looked at Philippians 3. You had a big crowd on January 1st. And Paul gives us really three questions to ask for a new year. These are good questions um, to journal and think about. What is your main goal in life? Paul says it is, and it's for all of us, to know Christ. Once you have received his grace, we'll talk a lot about that today through Christ's teaching. What, it, what does that mean? And then to know him is the goal of life. He uses this word gnosis, which is an experiential, intimate knowledge of, of someone. And then the two questions that follow. What are you going to leave behind? Habits, unforgiveness, shame, all the things. And what are you going to take with you? You can say, who are you going to take with you? Some of you need to do what others have done even today. You need to decide, I'm going to take these people with me. Like, I need believers around me. I need to make the step to... Join the fellowship. That's the thing I need to do on this Sunday as we kick into a new year. But here we find this whole idea of knowing Christ, the difference between knowing someone and knowing about someone, right? Uh, so some of you, to make the point, you know my wife, Stacy, like you have met her. Maybe you've had coffee with her. Uh, maybe you've had lunch with her. Maybe you've heard her speak at mops, you know, mothers of preschools. Maybe you have served in the preschool area with her. Maybe she's kept your child, you know, over the years. Um, maybe you just introduced yourself to her. She'd love to meet you. Um, I could go on and on. You may not know that she loves to read. Um, she loves sports, which is amazing. Um, and it's, it's really incredible. She uh, loves children. 
and she loves one child in particular uh, these days, um, our new grandson, Henry. She is a lover of people. I still say she's the purest person I know. And if I keep talking about her, I'm gonna, I'll get emotional. Love, she loves me so well. She's the glue that holds our family together. And I uh, praise God for her. Um, now you know more about her. But I know her. We've been married for 37 years. I know that for me to talk about her is really embarrassing. So I had to ask her ahead of time if I could do this. Like, don't bring the attention to me. I know what, I mean, think about it. What is, what's it to know anyone? I know what she does naturally. I know the depths of her heart. I know how she responds to certain situations. I know how she's going to respond to something that happens or something that I might say ahead of time. She knows the same about me. I know her. And the challenge that we have with Jesus is this. Like we can't see him. <laughs> I mean, let's be honest. How, how, do you, how do we have a relation? How is it to know him? And, and you're going to discover, I'm going to argue that the same way that I know her. Yeah, I could even argue that, no, no, no. He is nearer to me. Then Stacy, closer than my own skin, his spirit lives in me. There's a spiritual component, right? That, that I can know him, I can spend time with him, I can talk to him. And, and, and what you're going to learn uh, throughout the coming year, and a lot of us know this, but we're going to practice it. To know him, the Bible is your source. I've said it before. It, as a Christian, at some point, friends, you're going to have to get in the Bible. And so we're going to help you do that, all right? So to know him, I, I referenced this quote from uh, Dallas Willard, who wrote The Divine Conspiracy, a great book, uh, one of, maybe one of my top five books that I go to, back to, did again this year. Um, and he, he writes this, the premise of his book is this, my hope is to gain a fresh hearing for Jesus, especially among those who believe they already understand him, those who think they already know him. In this case, quite frankly, presumed familiarity, okay, follow along with him, a presumed familiarity with him has led to unfamiliarity. Like, I know him, I got him figured out, and then that leads to an unfamiliarity, not going deeper with who he really is. Unfamiliarity has led to contempt, okay, to look at him less than he is, I've got him figured out, done, and contempt has led to profound ignorance about who Jesus is. So this kind of sets up this whole series of messages that's going to guide us as a church family. Because here's the thing. A lot of us believe, and I can fall into this. I already know him. Like, I think I know as much about him as I'm going to know. And then we continue. If you're continuing to go deeper, it's like grace. Like I, I thought, I, I understand the grace of God. I wrote a whipping book about grace. And I, every day I'm blown away. Like, no. Like, recently, my mind is blown by his love for us. The fact that my sin doesn't repel him it actually triggers his heart towards me. It's what he does. He does, like Stacy, like me, like all of us, I do what I am. And so what we're going to see here is, you know, could it be the, like, how could we actually know him? What if we could actually hear from him? What if we could actually talk to him? What if we could hear from exactly what he says about himself and how he proves himself to be who he is? And of course, that is the Christian life. The Christian life is to hear from him, literally hear from him through his word, primarily, but other ways, and to obey him and then experience his power and obedience. So think about this. If I were to ask you, what is the main point of Jesus' teaching? Of all his teaching, what was the central thing that he was about? You could say love. Okay. Grace, again. Um, the kingdom of God. He talked a lot about that. Caring for others. Um, caring for the poor, the marginalized. I would argue that the key point of his teaching, the central point of his teaching was his identity. Who he claimed to be. Think about it. He wasn't put on a cross because he talked about love, though extreme love, radical love can get you in trouble. I've seen that. It happens. Um, but he was placed on a cross because of who he claimed to be. 
And so what if we could hear from him what he says about himself? And uh, let's, let's dive in. Because, again, the difference between knowing him and knowing about him. But here's the thing. And C.S. Lewis noted this. Um, you can't say that he was a great moral teacher. He didn't give us that option. If we understand who he is. He said he was either, you may have heard this, right? He was either a liar, he was a lunatic, or he was Lord. And so what I want us to do is turn to John, book of John. Go ahead and turn there. And again, you're going to need your Bible. Open your Bible because I'm not going to show you all the verses. We're going to go through uh, really a lot here uh, in, the, in John 6. Turn to John 6. And as you're turning there, I'm going to place this in context because we're going to talk now about uh, Jesus. The first, we're going to go chronologically through the book. We see seven I am statements in the book of John. And we're going to, we're going to start with I am the bread of life. Okay. So at this point, Jesus is gaining a lot of popularity. Um, people are following him. He's done some miracles. The King Jesus campaign is going really well. And then for others know he's a threat and Jesus establishes a pattern here that we're going to see throughout this whole series throughout the book of John, where he does something like some miraculous thing, a miracle that points to this teaching, then he says, this is who he is. What he does comes out of who he is. Or he'll claim something like, this is who I am, and then he'll do something to prove it. And this is the pattern we see here. This is where we see the feeding of the 5,000. The reason I need to set this up is this whole teaching that we're going to get to, um, when he lands in Capernaum here in a moment, is, is all built around what just happened the day before. I can literally see this passage in my mind. Some of us went to the Holy Land recently. We stayed on the Sea of Galilee on the North Shore, looking out over our hotel, literally on the Sea of Galilee, beautiful spot. To the east of us is Capernaum, where we went and stood in the place over temple ruins where Jesus taught this right here. We know exactly where this took place, which is really amazing. So they're not at Capernaum yet. In verse 5, uh, they, they ask, hey, where, where are, the, where are we going to get food for all these people? There's 5,000 plus people here. And in verse 6, it said that Jesus asked Philip this in order to test him because he knew what he was going to do. Um, and so in all four Gospels, it, it, it talks about uh, this miracle. It's the only miracle in all four Gospels, apart from the resurrection. Um, basketfuls left over. Perhaps you know the story. It's another story, another sermon. But verse uh, 15, it says they want him to force him to be king. Like, who doesn't want a king? Give me food, right? Just take care of me. I'll vote for you. And, and so they, they want him to be king. So because they want to force him to be king, he heads out again. He goes out in solitude into the mountain. Uh, the disciples row their boats to Capernaum. Jesus shows up on the water, another miracle, and uh, described further in Matthew and Mark. And the next day, the crowd shows up at Capernaum. And instead of affirming them, Jesus essentially rebukes them. It'd be like me saying, you know, next Sunday, welcome back. But let me talk about your motives as to why you're here. I mean, come on. You know, it's like, no, we're, we're back. And Jesus says, you're not here to see me. You're not here for me. You're here because I fed you. That's essentially what he says. You had dinner last night. Now you're here like, what's for breakfast? Let's go. And, he, and it says in verse uh, yeah, 26, he rebukes them. And he's saying, you're not pursuing me. And we, we tend to do the same. This, that's worth thinking about. What do we want from him instead of, no, I just want you. Because if we want from him when he doesn't give us what we want, breakfast or whatever in our lives or heal us or fix us the way we want it to go, then we're like, he doesn't hear from me. I reject him. I already know him. We think we're familiar with, the, with his ways. And then in verse 26, it says this. He says, you missed this. You missed the sign that I did. Now, this is real important too. I'm going to give you lots of things to hang on to. 17 times in the book of John, uh, centered around seven signs in the book of John, he, he uses this, this phrase, sign. Now, sign does what any sign does here on campus or whatever else. It points you to something or points you, in this case, to someone. Watch this. The sign, okay, the feeding of the 5,000, was a sign pointing to what? His identity, who he is, okay? So look at verse 27. 
Do not work for the food. Here's, here's where he enters into his teaching. Do not work for food that perishes, but for food that endures to eternal life, which the Son of Man gives. For on him, God the Father has set his seal, has set his authority, has placed on him all that, he, all that he's going to do. And that, so they heard the word work, okay, which is the default mode of the heart. And so they said, okay, wait, what, what work do we need to do? We heard you say something about work. What do we need to do in order to do the works of God? And Jesus answered them in, in verse 29. This is the work of God, that you believe in him whom he has sent. Believe. The work is to believe. And immediately we kind of roll our eyes and go, okay. I don't even really, again, I'm, what exactly does that mean? He's going to tell us. So look at verse 30. They then, what are we supposed to believe in? And this is kind of interesting. What sign shall we look for? And it's like, um, were you here yesterday? Like, did y'all not just see this? But then they go to, you know, Moses, you know, you want to talk about a sign. Moses, he fed uh, the people of Israel manna like bread. Not just one time, but like every day for 40 years. And then Jesus says um, in verse 32, that was, no, that was not Moses. My father, uh-oh, did this. Then in verse 33, he leans into his identity, who he is, and makes this radical statement. For the bread of God is he who comes down from heaven and gives life to the world. So the manna is not actually bread, but he who comes, all right? And they ask him to give them this bread. You know, you can imagine. They're still trying to figure out what he's saying. Verse 35, he drops this bombshell on them. Jesus said to them, I am the bread of life. Whoever comes to me shall not hunger. Whoever believes in me shall never thirst. And then here he enters into explaining all of this by saying who he is, what he gives, and what we get. All right, so first, who he is. He says, of course, I am the bread of life. Now, this will help us throughout the series to realize there's two ways to say I am in the Greek. One is I, me, and the other is, uh, is I may. So, well, no, ego is one, and then I may. So ego, I may. You hear the word ego, uh, uh, ego in the Greek, I am. But he uses both of these phrases is the point. I am, I am the bread of life. It's kind of an emphatic kind of construction, but it's a real rare structure. The only, well, you see it when he says his I am statements, but you see it in uh, Exodus 3. Some of you, some of you are following me here, uh, where, he, where Moses asks, who are you, God. Who do I tell them is speaking to us here? And in the Greek Septuagint, okay, which is the Greek translation of the Old Testament, the same construction. Ego, I may. Like, wait, what? I am who I am. What? That's a weird name. And God is saying, that's Yahweh, literally, is what that is. And God is saying, I, I am who I am and who I say I am. You don't put a name on me. I determine who I am. I'm self-existent apart from you. I am who I am. Jesus is making this same statement every time he uses these seven statements. And here he says, I am. It's another way of saying uh, the bread of life, I am. The bread of life, it's me. He's saying that he is the God the, of, of our father, Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, he is God. Look at verse 36. But I said to you that you have seen me and yet do not believe. All that the Father gives me will come to me. And whoever comes to me, I will never cast out. For I have come down from heaven, uh-oh, not to do my own will, but the will of him who sent me. Look at what he's saying. I have come down from heaven. I'm preexistent. And, and I am holding all things together. I, I'm doing the Father's will. I can draw people to me, uh, and he will not cast them out. I am up to something with the Father. He is the second person of the Trinity. And then in verse 39, look at this. It says, and this is the will of him who sent me, 
He's being really clear. Now, we know on the backside of the cross, we know a lot more of this, but they're going, wait, okay, hold on. He's being very explicit now. He keeps digging, you know, going deeper, doubling down, that I should lose nothing of all that he has given me, but raise it up on the last day. And we're going to see this four times. He now references the last day, closing time, when he comes again and redeems all things. Game over. He brings the keys and it's time to end all things. He comes heaven to earth, a resurrected savior coming to a now resurrected new earth, resurrected people living this Zoe eternal abundant life in the resurrection. And, and that's again, another sermon. But what he's saying is he holds it all together. Again, my father, and he's holding everything together. Everything is created by him, for him, and through him, and to him. And so he is the bread of life, of all life. Now, what does he give? Let's talk about what he gives. He gives eternal life. Now, you've already caught this. He's going to say in other places, and he says it here. No, you, you, you get me. It's what you get. Because you don't get anything apart from coming to him. And here we see, this is another key word, zoe. We talk about this often. Um, there's three ways to say life in the Greek. One is bios, which is physical life. Another is suke. We get the word psychology, if you will. Soulful life. Okay, can reference also, I come back to life uh, physically. But uh, then there's the word zoe which is abundant, eternal, everlasting life. Now, if you're like me, if you grew up in church, you hear everlasting life, everlasting, ever, it's heaven, heaven. And we think then come to Christ, wait at the concourse for your plane to arrive, and then bam, you're zapped up to heaven. When you die, you go to heaven. That's, that's really it. And that's not what this word means. It means, yes, everlasting, meaning in all of its qualities, joys, purpose, abundant life, John 10, 10, it is the abundant life here and now, and yes, forever. And he uses this word, we see this 36 times in the book of John, more than all three other gospel writers combined. One of his favorite words, 11 times in this chapter alone. This is eternal life in the here and now. Think about it. Jesus is saying bread, right? Kind of core food brings life, could keep you alive. You eat and you need to eat again. Some of y'all getting hungry right now. And so verse 41, Jesus says, uh, so the Jews grumbled. No, it says, so the Jews grumbled about him because he said, I am the bread of life. Here's what got him that came down from heaven. Like he's, okay, he's talking about kind of like manna, but he's saying he is that. And he's come preexistent from heaven. They said, is not this Jesus, the son of Joseph, whose father and mother we know? How does he now say, I have come down from heaven? Again, over the hill, I'm imagining this, 20 miles away, Nazareth. They're like, this, we know him. We know his family. We know where he lives. This, why is he saying this? This is nuts. Watch this. Their presumed familiarity leads to an unfamiliarity, leads to contempt and complete ignorance about who he really is. I say that because we can do the same. I got him. I get it. And, and how, like, how would I know? Uh, I, you know, I'm, I go to church like once a month or I... I read the Bible every now and then because that's all I need. I'm good. Wow. We fall into the same pattern that they do. And Jesus says in verse 43, Jesus answered them, do not grumble among yourselves. No one can come to me unless the father who sent me draws them or draws him. Even faith is a gift from God drawing us to himself and I will raise him up. Here it is again on the last day. What? He's holding the past preexistent, the present, and the future in his hands. I'll raise him up. Anyone who believes, and he's going to raise up and redeem all things in the end. And in verse 45, it says, it is written in the prophets, and they will all be taught by God. The Messiah will come, and they'll actually hear from him. 
Everyone who has heard and learned from the Father comes to me. Not that anyone has seen the Father, except he who is from God. He has seen the Father. And here it is. Look at this. This is the gospel. I saw this this week. In one simple sentence. I mean, it doesn't explain all things like maybe a John 3.16 or 2 Corinthians 5.21. We often run to. Look at verse 40, 47. Truly, truly, I say to you. This is the truth. Here it is. Here it is. I say, whoever believes has eternal life. Whoever believes. This is, okay, the word believe is 241 times um, in the New Testament, 100 times by John alone. This is his favorite word. His favorite word, believe, not works, but to believe. This is how we receive Zoe life. Look at verse uh, 48. I am the bread of life. There it is. Your fathers ate the manna in the wilderness and they died. He's saying, okay, so let's go there. 40 years, miracle in in the desert. God took care of them and they still all died. He's saying, there's a food that you eat and you're still going to die. Every one of us in here will die. If the Lord tarries, look at verse 50. This is the bread that comes down from heaven. So that no one, look at this, so that one may eat of it and not die. I am the living bread, okay, that came down from heaven. If anyone eats of this bread, he will live forever. And the bread that I will give for the life of the world is my flesh. Hmm. Now it's getting funky, right? Um, what, What does he give? He gives himself and through him comes life. Let's talk about this. What what do we get? Let's look at what we get. Now, if we're we're not careful in our, our preaching prep meeting, um, this week, we're like, wait, no. So now we're going to just kick into, yeah, what do I get? Like, how do I get this? What do I need to do to get this thing? And we fall in the same trap that they have found themselves in. And Jesus is saying, no, you, you get me. You, you get me. You get me and everything that comes with me. You get nothing apart from coming to me, to a person. And he gives us life. Believe. Believe what? Believe in what he's done. Believe that he came, that he died on the cross for your sin and receive like eating, right? Receive him. Think about this. We were to take him and eat his flesh and blood. And he says, that's what believing is. You take food and you put it into you and it becomes sustenance, life for you. That's what he's saying, right? Uh, and, And so many of you, um, I, I wonder how many of you, you can raise your hands in the, in the sanctuary as well. How many of you were watching the game, Monday night football game on Monday night? Was anybody watching it in real time? How many of you heard the story about DeMar Hamlin? It's on the news then following through, through the rest of the week. I was in the kitchen working away. I don't always do this, but I'm working away, trying to finish up lots of emails and such. I'd been working on this sermon and the game's on because, you know, Stacy like is enjoying the game. And, um, and she, I mean, she's doing some other things, but it's kind of on. And then, but then when uh, uh, DeMar Hamlin went down, cardiac arrest on the field, that's when, you know, it wasn't, we didn't even have it turned up much or anything. And I was like, what is happening right now? And everybody gathered around. They, everybody stopped. The whole game stopped because this man had fallen out, 24 year old uh, Buffalo Bills player, fall down on the field. And they're, they're trying to resuscitate him on the field. Guys are weeping, they're crying, they're coming to each other, they're praying, they're on their knees. Guys from different teams are gathering together. Everything shut down. And I, I think like a lot of us, I, oh my gosh, are we watching this young man die right now? And then they cart him off. Everybody is, doesn't know what to say, what to do. They shut the game down, no more. And and they take him to the hospital. Didn't hear about it for some time. I thought he was dead. And I think a lot of people did. But here's what struck me. Two things. Death or the possibility of death stops us in our tracks. We don't know what to do with it. I, I watched the, um, the announcers then. They're trying to fill time. Like, well, we don't know 
what to do now? Um, in fact, I'm on my computer, so I just started writing down and said, you know what? One of them was a former player. He says, we're all, we're all just football players right now. We're all just, we're for our brother, they called him. Um, we're all just, we're just human now. We're all in solidarity with him and what's going on. All we care about now is not the football game. We care about this young man, and that's all we care about. We don't care about the playoff situation. We care about him, and, and that's all we care about. And, and I thought two things. One, how death, the possibility of death just shuts us down. We don't know what to do with it. The other is I thought this is the church. This is a picture of a church. Everybody in solidarity with the dying, with the broken, with the hurting. We're all about that person. And the people in our lives who are dying, who are trying to eat the bread of this world. And it leaves us not just famished, but longing for more. And it will never satisfy. And can I just say to you, honestly, as your pastor, I know what it is to try to eat the bread of this world that does not satisfy and to be left wanting. And it is a dark and difficult place to be. And we turn to the one who brings life. Gang, I, my question for you would be, what bread are you eating these days to bring you life? Like where you re really think you're going to find it? Because it, 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 was, it was just amazing. The, the person, everyone, where's his mom? We saw his mom, his parents, his family. He's taking pictures with him earlier. Where's his mom? Because if, you, if any parents here, you're like, get me down there to my boy. I got to get on the field. I got to be with him. And see, this is not only the church, but it is the church because this is Jesus. Jesus comes to all of us in our brokenness. And yes, in our sin, in our craziness, he says, I am not repelled by your sin. I'm drawn to you. I'm, my love is triggered by your sin. I'm coming to you. I'm here to save you. I'm here to rescue you and to bring you life. See, here's the thing. Nobody knew what to say because we don't know what to do with death. We don't want to talk about death. We, it's somebody else's problem. And only Jesus knows how to step into that space. I mean, I was sitting there thinking of this message and I thought only Jesus steps into life and death situations and says, I know exactly what's going to happen. And I can bring life. I can bring resuscitation to your soul right now. Only, listen, say what you will about suffering, about the challenges and pains of this world and things that you have gone through and are going through. You cannot say that Jesus has turned his back and he has nothing to do with you. You cannot say that God does not care. And he looks at our pain and says, wow, that's messed up. And he goes another way. You cannot say that. He has come right in the middle of it. And before you desire a life that is imperishable, friends, you have to recognize that your life is perishable. You are perishing right now. And the food that we eat will keep us alive till dinner time. And maybe tomorrow. And we'll keep on eating. This is what Jesus says. You go after the world. You're eating the stuff of this world. And it will continue. You'll still die. And Jesus says, you are what you eat. Are you eating the stuff of this world that's killing you? And he says, to eat is to believe. So look at this. We, we, we receive him. Believing is this. Here's what he's saying. Taking, eating, let it become you, your sustenance for life. I mean, we even say, ask Jesus in your heart, you know, which is strange. Um, but that's what it means, to believe what he has done. But here's what I want you to see. Jesus does not get in you by default. You have to make a decision. You have to come to him. In verse 52, look at what it says. The Jews then disputed among themselves saying, how can this man give us his flesh to eat? So Jesus said to them, look, he doubles down. Like his PR guys, you know, Peter or somebody's going, Jesus, that's not going well. This is, you got it. This is weird. Now you're cannibalism. This is so strange. And Jesus doubles down. Truly, truly, I say to you, unless you eat, of the flesh of the Son of Man and drink his blood, you have no life in you. Unless you believe, clearly he's talking about his flesh and his blood broken on the cross 
for our sin and for eternal life. Listen, if death is always someone else's problem, then Jesus will always be someone else's savior. You don't need him. And I'm not trying to scare anybody today or freak anybody out, but it's too often we don't think about the last day. And that's where everything is going, where all of us are heading. It is certain that you're going to stand before God Almighty and you're going to give an account based on not your good works or bad works, but what you've done with Christ and whether you have believed. So I want us to close this portion of our time together by praying together. And I want us all just to bow your heads and close your eyes here in the great hall, in the sanctuary, watching online, because I believe that eternity weighs in the balance for some of us here. And I'll ask you, do you know him? Have you received his grace? Believed? Do you believe that he died on the cross for your sins? And have you made a decision to receive his grace? Die to yourself and live for him. If you have, praise him. Thank you, Lord. If you haven't, there's coming a day. You will leave this earth and stand before God. And if you haven't received him, do so now. Say, Lord, come into my life. I, I, I'm going to eat. I'm going to drink. I believe. I receive your grace right now. What you've done for me on the cross, I receive it by faith. And I give you my life. Lord, we love you and we praise you. We give you our lives to worship you with everything we've got. In your name we pray. Amen. If you followed that story on Wednesday, um, he woke up. They asked Damar. No, he asked. Did you catch this? Who won the game? And I love the response of the doctors. They said, hey, Damar, you won. You won the game of life. And I thought about that too. I, I love that. But I thought, mm, no, nah, he didn't win. He just woke up is what he did. The doctors, you could argue, they won. Like the, 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 the medics on the field won. They brought him back to life. Here's the thing. If you're a believer, if you just received Christ even now, um, there's coming a day you're going to die. But a believer, it's like walking into another room. It's like waking up and saying, wait a minute. I look like I won. Who won? And Jesus to say, I won for you. You win. Enter into Zoe life, resurrected, eternal life, unlike anything you've ever imagined. That's where all of this goes. And so here's the great application for us today. And this is the, the challenge we're going to bring to everybody in our church. I am really excited about this. this. is why we want everybody to hear this. And I've asked Keith Lowry. He's our discipleship pastor. They just step up here with us um, to uh, you get to know him a little bit, but also to hear about what we're calling dwell. So Keith, I know a lot of people haven't met you uh, in Suzanne. So first of all, just tell us who you are. You're, you're kind of new. We've seen you around. I love serving with you. And Likewise. we believe that God has yeah. brought you here with such a passion for discipleship. Tell us about your family, first of all. Thanks. Uh, hope that you've had a chance to meet my wife, Suzanne. Like Stacy, I can't really point toward her right now or I'll be having lunch with you and Stacy today. But um, <laughs> if you know her and you have a chance to meet her, she's kind of back that way. Uh, would you tell her that you're praying for her? Because, I mean, you know. Married to you. Yeah, yeah married yeah, to yeah. me. Okay. Uh, sweet, sweet wife. Uh, three grown kids. Uh, seven grandkids. And uh, several of our kids are in ministry. Uh, some of my kids are in uh, outside Nairobi mm -hmm. and uh, Kenya. So just a great family and a great opportunity for us. We love being here. And by Praise the way, the go Tigers. So, oh, yeah, yeah. go Tigers. Wow. Yeah. Okay. Clemson, what, what are we doing? <laughs> yeah. LSU, okay. Yeah, yeah. Uh, yes, from, from Baton Rouge, yes, am I right? Yeah. yeah. Okay, so I get it. And yeah. uh, okay, Keith or others here, I don't know. Um, another Keith, yeah. So, hey, as, uh, as we talk about this, so we're here to lead all generations to love Jesus. Love that. That's what we're all about. Mm -hmm. How does Joel come into play? Talk to us about this. 
So we've talked about this. Our staff has talked about it. We've had uh, other groups talking about this. What, what is discipleship really? And we've said, and I agree, discipleship is really a lifetime of learning to follow Jesus more closely. And the, the challenge that we face is we've got a thousand daily decisions where we're asking, you know, which way do I go? Am I going to follow this way, the way the world is leading me, or am I going to follow the path that leads uh, to Christ? And Jesus said in John 10, 27, my sheep hear my voice, they listen to my voice, I know them, and they follow me. And so dwell is really an intentional process of helping us focus on the path that leads to Jesus by pulling away a little bit from all of those clamoring voices that are calling for our attention and our hearts and focus on the voice of Christ as he leads us. I believe he wants to speak to us through his word and dwell is designed to give us a chance to hear him. Uh, uh, this dwell process is kind of like a huge, bright LED light that gives us light for the path so that we know how to follow mm, it. That's good. Yeah. I've told you my word for the year um, is focus, mm -hmm. right? Because not just focus in the moment on, because it's distractions. And I want to be focused, uh, starting every day with it in his word and right. focus on whomever he puts in front of me. How does this differ then? This is what I'm really excited about. How does it differ from other reading plans that some of us may have done? How, yeah. do, how does this differ well, from that? Many of us have done reading plans that are, content heavy. We're going to read through the Bible in a month and uh, things of that nature. Can we get Leviticus? So many. Oh, Leviticus. Yeah, it's hard. Yeah. Uh, so, so much content. And because often we get in these reading plans that are so content heavy, uh, it mm. can become a cognitive process yep. for us. And so dwell, the intent is not checking boxes or reading every chapter. The intent is learning a new skill. And that is how to read a brief passage out of God's Word, listening for the voice of the Holy Spirit. I believe God wants to speak to you through His Word. And if you begin this little reading time with this simple prayer, Lord, speak to me through your Word today. And then as you read, look for the verse that leaps off the page. Mm. Stop, highlight that verse, and then ask yourself two quick questions about that verse. Uh, and by the way, here's a pro tip. Grab a notebook and just keep a few notes. Journal. Your answer yep. to these questions. Don't use the J word that nobody journals. Oh, not, not journal. But uh, just Sorry. jot a couple of notes, answers to these questions. I write in a little book that is yeah, like a, a, yeah, has a leather. A, book, a bookie a... book, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Or on a phone. So question I mean, number do. one is, what new thing is God showing you through this verse? And here's a question you really want to ask at that point. What is it about this particular verse that the Holy Spirit wanted to draw me to? Why did, he, why did he pick this verse to glow off the page for me? And then the second question is, how can I be obedient Excellent. Uh, to that? Yeah. So we've talked about how yeah, being a disciple is not a body of content. Like what I know about him up against knowing him, it's, too, it's a skill set. How to hear from God and how to obey him. Exactly. Right? And those are the two questions. Um, everybody can get one of these uh, bookmarks on your way out. Uh, out here or in the, uh, I say in the commons or in the in foyer, the uh -huh. mm -hmm. um, in, in the sanctuary. Yeah. And grab one today. It's also on our, on our website. Now, you're having a meeting. This is for everybody in our church. Am I right? Everybody. What, tell, yeah. tell us about that. You've got a meeting coming up with some leaders. Yeah, that we'll can talk to leaders about this. And by the way, if, if we have run out of these, they're very popular today. You can mm. just go to our, our website on the homepage of our website, click on download the reading plan. You get a PDF of this. We do want everybody, and it might be people that don't even live around us. We want everybody to have a chance to do this. I've and sent imagine, links to friends of mine already. Just I've imagine, already what if everybody in our church is reading the same passage every day and asking those two questions? Every age group is going to be doing this. Children, students, adults, we're all doing this together. What if we all doing that together? What if connect groups took two to three minutes at the beginning of class mm. as people are gathering and ask people just to turn to their head, hey, what did you read this week that really had an impact on you? And begin to share and see where God is leading us. What if your neighbor or your coworker, or a friend or a family member who's not a believer began to, to read just and ask, ask them, these questions I, I'm together. curious, you want to join me and I'm, just read? I'm doing this great reading. Would you like yeah. to join me? Yep. You can send the link to people, invite others to do it. What if so all good. of us have been doing this for years? Can you imagine the life-changing impact as we all shine a bright light on the path that leads to Jesus? Praise the Lord. Yeah. We would be a different church altogether. Amen. Amen. Okay, so who's in? Anybody in? Let's go. Let's do this, gang. And Keith, thank you so much you. for your leadership and explanation here.
So gang, here's the thing. As we close our time together, um, later on in that passage in John 6, uh, what happens is exactly what happens every time God, Jesus gets real explicit about, uh, about who he is. Either, hey, that's a hard saying, and people turn away. It says many disciples turned away. And then it says that others believed. That's where we are today. 